Well, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, please, throughout the kind of conversation today, um, please just feel free to kind of chime in, raise your hand. We want to make this um, as interactive as possible. So just so you all know what we're doing today, here's our brief agenda. We're going to talk about who we are, why we're here, overview of the right to counsel national campaign, the role of defense lawyers, the power of culture, and then we're going to have a facilitated conversation. And this whole time, we're also going to be talking about why court managers. So before I go into that, just a quick question um, and a show of hands. Who's heard of or is familiar with the Right to Counsel National Campaign? All right, awesome, a couple of you. Um, and then last year, John did a plenary session followed by a workshop at the annual conference. Um, were any of you guys in attendance there? Please raise your hand as well so we know where we're going. Great, because we're going to just sort of build, build on that. Um, so really quickly, just to give you a little bit more about where I work, I work at the justice programs at American University. Um, JPO is a center at the School of Public Affairs. We provide, we've been providing training and technical assistance to the criminal justice community for over 30 years. We have a number of projects, including the National Drug Court Resource Center. I'm going to go through this quickly just because it's not really the meat of our presentation, but all of these are online. And we also have packets here um, with more information. So we house the National Drug Court Resource Center, uh, the Right to Counsel National Campaign that we're here to talk about today that I lead, um, the Justice in Government Project, which provides strategic guidance to state and local officials um, on civil legal aid, and the Juvenile Drug Treatment Court Training and Technical Assistance Initiative, providing TTA to um, those in the juvenile drug treatment court profession. So the Right to Counsel National Campaign, who are we and what do we do? So it's a group of um, multidisciplinary consortium members, and the goal is to inform and engage policymakers, all criminal justice stakeholders, and the public about the importance of meaningfully carrying out the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. And we do this within our vision of that a fair and equitable criminal justice system requires effective representation by skilled defense attorneys at every step of the way. So the reason this started was back in 2015 was when we sort of launched. And this is sort of just a snapshot, um, just so you can kind of get a visual of the fragmented system of delivery systems of public defense. There is no one size fits all. There is no jurisdiction that's the same. And we really realized that some of, this, some of the problems that every system faces are similar. Um, but we really needed to kind of have this national conversation about what is going on in the state of public defense. So again, here, this is a uh, visual of the different types of delivery systems. And here, you can say all the different ways that um, defense is funded. It can be either through kind of fully county funded, joint with state, mainly state, fully state funded. And in some places, um, like Louisiana, it's mainly funded through fines and fees. So with that, the Right to Counsel National Campaign sort of launched. And it was a cooperative with um, the Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance. And our goals are to raise public awareness about uh, the rights, the constitutional right to counsel, what it means to actually deliver effective representation, spearhead broad-based initiatives with policymakers in multiple sectors, and then um, kind of develop this strategic vision of what is the role of public defenders and ensure that the public defense voice is involved in all criminal justice conversations. So our members, like I said, we have a multidisciplinary um, group of consortium members from defenders, prosecutors, judges, law enforcement. Um, you can see everything, including court personnel. And the reason why is because we fully believe that to kind of have any sustainable reform, it takes every single actor in the criminal justice system. Again, this is just a snapshot, and I can talk more about it if people have questions, but this is just sort of a visual map of our theory of change that provides a visual and lays out sort of how we get to our overall goal, which is that the idea of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel is universal, and the application of it is universal. And to get there, we recognize that you need to have policy changes and structural changes, and also our culture needs to change to welcome these. And you can't do kind of one without the other. There's no order what goes first, what goes second, but both kind of need to go hand in hand. And so we're going to be talking a lot today about culture. So why court managers? Like I said already, you know, to have any type of sustainable change really requires the active engagement of every criminal justice system actor. And everyone plays a unique and a different role. 
Um, so we don't know what we don't know. So we started out by doing a public opinion survey to first realize what does the public know about public defenders and the right to counsel? And then from there, we've launched into kind of round tables and more specifics on given what that, what the public knows and doesn't know, how does this impact each individual actor in the criminal justice system? Um, so we brought with us as well our reports of the public opinion research, so please come and take them at the end um, if you want. So last year at the annual conference, we held a focus group with court managers, um, and we've done this with a number of different system actors, including law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, uh, county officials, and state administering agencies. And in each session, we sort of explored what is everyone's own perceptions of public defense, both nationally and in their own jurisdiction. What are challenges that they face? What is each person's role in overcoming those challenges and ensuring the right to counsel? Do you think you have a role and why or why not? And then sort of possible solutions. So like I said, kind of we started this conversation last year where we held the round table and then following um, John had a plenary and we did a workshop to kind of go deeper and to explore some of both, both the policy and the structural challenges, but also what are those cultural challenges? What do we see as our ideals? And then kind of how can we overcome those challenges? So John, you're up. All right. So, you know, last year when I came to this conference, um, I, I was really moved. It was great to, to meet with so many court managers uh, because I, I was a public defender for years. I spent a lot of time in courts in starting in Washington, D.C. I was here in Georgia. I was in New Orleans. Um, and the folks who run the courts, the court managers, the court administrators, um, to me are absolutely critical to uh, how our public views the justice system. Right? And so I want to I start by asking you some questions. Because Genevieve sort of said at the end we're going to do facilitated discussion. I actually think this time is going to fly by because this is going to be so fun, right? And so interesting and so entertaining. Before you know it, it's going to be 4:30, and we're not going to have time for question and answer. So I'm going to ask y'all to, to 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 participate as I go through, and we'll just go as far as we can go. So so let me start by asking this: What have you seen in the news lately that shapes the public perception of justice? and what justice means to people in this country. What sorts of things have you seen in the news? Don't all scream out at once, it's okay. Think about it, let well, me ask this. How, how, many of you, how many of you followed news stories of children being ripped from parents' arms as they cross the border? D does that say something to us about what justice looks like in America? Does it? What about, um, there was, you know, there have been a, 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 a spate of police shootings over the last few years, starting with Michael Brown, right? There was most recently, not most recently, but recently Stephon Clark in Sacramento shot 20-some times. Did you all hear about these? Do those shape our perception of what justice means in America? How many of you heard, have heard of the term mass incarceration? What's that? What does that mean to you? What's that? Okay. A punitive system where we are locking away lots of people, right? We are incarcerating a lot of people, oftentimes from nonviolent offenses. How many have heard about wrongful convictions? Right? Wrongful convictions. All of that has to do with justice. And I raise that with you because I think whenever people think about justice, they think about the courts. And how you interact with people shapes their vision of justice. So, um, so where do people in the courts, how do they access justice? How do they access it? Through a lawyer. Right. When you think about the right to counsel, it is through the lawyer that every other right is realized. And so when we train our lawyers, Gideon's Promise is an organization that trains young public defenders. And we teach them that there are certain things, certain fundamental uh, 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 values 
that we have to embrace, certain things that every person should expect from their lawyer. If I said to you, what are things, you, you, how, how many of you are in courtrooms where you watch lawyers work? Half of you, a little more than half. So what are things you think every person should expect of their lawyer? And, and let me actually say, how many of you actually watch uh, lawyers operate in criminal courtrooms? Because we're really today going to focus on criminal courts. What should people expect of lawyers? They've met with their client. Good. What else? I think here, we're, we're being reported, so I think we had to use this. That oh. they have the information they need, like reports and, and documents and things like that. Okay, that their lawyer, or that they've gotten information, where do they get that information from? But it's going to come through the lawyer, right? Ultimately, that's handed to the lawyer, and it's the lawyer's responsibility to share it with the client. Communication, what else? What do we expect from lawyers? That they're knowledgeable about the law, that they have time to do research, legal research, to understand the law, to know defenses. That they appear in court. That they show up in court, that their lawyers Sorry. care enough to be there when you're there. Right. That when they get into the courtroom, their lawyer is going to protect them from the processes that could be abusive of their rights. That the lawyer is going to protect them. That is the protector. So these are some of the things that we teach our lawyers, every client should expect from them. Lawyers should be loyal to the client. Have any of you been in courts where you felt like the lawyer might be loyal to someone other than the client? Who? Who might the lawyer be loyal to if it's not the client? Judge. Judge. The prosecutor may be concerned about the relationship, more concerned about the relationship with the prosecutor than their own client. Right? Certainly. Um, respect for what the, the, what the client wants out of the representation. It's the client's life. Right? It's not the lawyer's decision to be paternalistic and decide what's best for the client. It's the client's life. Is the client getting a voice? How many of you have been in courtrooms where you felt like, I'm not sure that what the lawyer is saying is actually what the client wants them to say? Okay, that's a disconnect with the right to counsel. Investigation, that the lawyer's gone out and investigated, right, and helped find another side of the story, legal research, litigation, communication, we talked about all that. So that's how the client accesses justice. But I also want to say to you, I think one of the most important things you all do is you don't only have an obligation to run the courts so that clients access justice. I think you actually run courtrooms that help entire families and communities access justice. Right? It's not just the client, it's the people in court who love the client. So I founded Gideon's Promise with my wife. Okay, my wife is not a lawyer. My wife got involved in the criminal justice system or, or, or was introduced to the criminal justice system at the age of five. Her father was arrested for crimes he had committed years earlier. By the time he was arrested, he had turned his life around, he got married, converted to Islam, built a, 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 a fish market, he had a small business, he had four children, my wife was the oldest at five years old, and he was arrested for crimes he'd committed years earlier, and he was given a public defender that never told that story, right? that never shared that information. He was processed through a court system into Attica State Correctional Facility in New York, and my, for 10 years, my wife grew up knowing her father through bars. And one thing she always says that sticks with me is she says, you know what was even harder than growing up with a father in prison? Was realizing that I belong to a population of people that don't matter. We're throwaways. No one cares about us. And you think about what is it that makes a five-year-old girl believe a system doesn't care about them? 
it's inter sometimes it's interactions with the criminal justice system. So when you think about what you can do to make the criminal justice system more just for families and communities, I think you got to look at several things. Look at your courtrooms. Do your courtrooms suggest justice is being done? How many of you feel like there are things going on in your courtrooms that might signal to people in those courtrooms that really justice for you is not a priority? Anyone have an example of something that, you, that, that could be done better in your courtrooms? The cattle call on arraignment day where they're waiting for hours. The cattle call. I love that. The cattle call, right? Which is sort of what this illustrates. You're ushered in like cattle and you just sit and sit and sit and wait. How many of you sort of have a vision when, when she says cattle call? Does that mean something to some of you? Okay. Cattle call. Well, anything else that you see? doesn't show up you're told repeatedly to go back and forth and contact your attorney and don't come back in the courtroom until you have an attorney you have a lot of attorneys that aren't on time don't you correct clearly I could tell that's happening tell in your courtroom <laughs> yeah like, well, what about this how many of you are in courtrooms where litigants are expected to be there on time lawyers are expected to be there on time but the judge doesn't take the bench till 10 o'clock any of you see that happen? No one's, no one's got your name. We're not going to call your judge. <laughs> Any of you see that happen? When it does happen, how many times do the, does the judge profusely apologize? Right? What does that say about what justice means? So what happens in the courtroom? After the courtroom, after people leave the courtroom, many of them are sent to jails where they communicate with loved ones through thick glass and, and phones. Right? This is what folks, a lot of folks walking into your courtroom have been going through the frustration of this and you need to understand that when they come in your courtroom. right? Because your courtroom is just an extension of, of a whole set of experience they were having before that. And they might be frustrated. right? If any of them are there after conviction, maybe they're in prisons that are packed. It says something about what justice means. Maybe they finished their sentence, but because of collateral consequences, they can't get jobs, they can't go back to their homes, they can't get educational loans, they're rendered homeless. Right? I want to just say, uh, I want to give a shout out to Rosalie Joy. Is anyone here from Atlanta? Which courts? In Fulton? So Rosalie, I met Rosalie here in Atlanta. Rosalie was the public defender for the, for the city in, in Atlanta's municipal court. And Rosalie uh, had lawyers who were carrying 17, 1,800 cases a year. Right? They, would, they would process 17, 1,800 cases a year. Rosalie pushed back against that. She was in a court where routinely people would be, be given bonds they couldn't make. Homeless people who clearly couldn't afford anything would be given bonds for you know urinating in public that would have them locked in the courts and she stood up and she resisted that and as a result Rosalie got fired because she refused to be silent about that injustice Rosalie uh, is an exception unfortunately because I see public defenders all over the country more often rather than be silent they go along with that processing Right? They sort of participate in that processing. And one thing I've learned as I've sort of started thinking about culture is that, is that they don't go along with it because they necessarily mean to contribute to injustice. Sometimes we just get used to a status quo that's unjust. Right? So this, this image, uh, for those of you who were at my talk last year, you've seen this, this photo. It's called Indifference by Frank Wu, and it's these robotic legs walking past a homeless veteran curled up in a fetal position. And the message is really quite straightforward, right? That all of us become so bombarded with misery and poverty and hopelessness that 
over time, it's just kind of human nature to become desensitized to it. We kind of walk past it. I, I shared a story about how um, I've got two kids who are big homeless advocates. My son, Lucas, who's now 10, when he was seven, he said to me, Daddy, if you could be anyone in the world when you grow up, other than me, his sister Aaliyah, or mommy, who would you be? And I said, I don't know, Lucas, who would you be? And he said, I'd either be Antonio Brown, his favorite football player, or a homeless person. I said, a homeless person, Lucas, why would you be a homeless person? He said, well, because then I would know what it feels like and I could grow up to do something about it. My daughter used to, on the way to school, take money out of her piggy bank to give to the homeless man on the off-ramp. They were really concerned about homelessness. We were walking down the street one day and a man said, sir, can you spare a dollar? And I said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And we kept walking. I felt this tug on my sleeve and it was my daughter. And she said, Daddy, and I said, yeah, baby. She said, Daddy, doesn't that man need a dollar more than you? And I thought to myself, of course, she, of course he does, right? And then I thought to myself, where'd she learn that? And she learned it from me and she learned it from her mother and it's a reminder that all of us, right, parents, lawyers, court managers, all of us, if we don't guard against indifference, we can start to become desensitized. And I think what Genevieve and I really want to push you all to think about today is what are the injustices that happen in your courts that maybe just over time you've gotten used to? Not because you're a bad person, but because you can only shoulder so much injustice before you tune it out. Right? And that's really what culture is. Right? Culture really is, it's like a white water river. It's like this, it's like this force where you jump in it and you can think you're going to swim against the current. And you can start swimming, but over time your arms get tired and one of two things happen. Either you're going to go with that current or you're going to get out. And you all are in systems that have a culture, that have a current. And as much as you may try to swim against them, there will be times that that current will take you places that if you really stop and think about it, it's not exactly what clients, families, communities deserve. And we want to explore that a little bit. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump. Yes, yeah, so we're already 30 minutes in. Um, so let me jump to, to this model that we used last year. And I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, so this whole program, this whole uh, uh, conference is called Mind the Gap, right? Mind the Gap. And that fits nicely with a model that we teach our lawyers that we call closing the gap. Because we work with lawyers, but I think this applies to prosecutors and judges and court managers and everyone in the criminal justice system. Right. We, we teach our lawyers that there is a world of vision and aspiration that our clients deserve. There's a way they deserve to be treated. There's something they deserve from every lawyer. They deserve a lawyer who's loyal who's going to be their voice and speak for them, who's going to investigate every case, who's going to do legal research, who's going to communicate with them. And then we say to our lawyers, but you know what? Some of you are carrying 300 cases. There's no way you can do that for every client. And we're going to teach you this gold standard, and you're going to go back to your offices, and you are going to feel completely ineffective because you can't live up to this standard. You have a reality. And when that reality doesn't meet the aspiration, it can really cause emotional trauma. Right? You can start to feel burned out. You can start to feel guilty because you're watching all these people fall through the cracks. And what we say to our lawyers is rather than focusing on all of the, all of the injustice that happens on your watch that you can't control, think about how you can inch reality a little closer to aspiration every day. What is it you can do individually to just make that world a little more just? And if you just do that little bit and your colleague in the next courtroom does the same thing and another group do it in the next county over and another group in the next state over, collectively you're starting to push reality closer to aspiration. What you don't want to be is one of those lawyers that becomes resigned to this status quo and never tries to inch towards aspiration. And so we teach them a model. And we're going to talk about how it applies to you. And the model is close the gap. And we say to them, 
When you have a challenge, when you recognize that what you're doing isn't what justice demands, let's do four things. One, let's articulate the reality. What is the objective reality you're facing right now that you feel falls short of what our justice system demands? Two, what's your vision? What should that world look like that you're not achieving? You've now defined the gap. Three, what are some of the reasons that that reality doesn't match that aspiration? What are the obstacles, right? They might be cultural, they might be structural, they might be financial, they might be, right, something that, a, that there might be rules that, that, that keep you from doing what you feel you need to do. What are those obstacles? And we list them. And then strategies. What are things you can do to identify the obstacles that are easy to tackle? How can you chip away at those obstacles little by little so instead of feeling overwhelmed by all, the, all of the injustice you can't address, you can actually feel good about what you can deal with? Yeah, and I would just want to add one thing. I think it's important to remember that not only is this an exercise that you can do with you know, yourselves here as court managers or that John does with public defenders, um, that you can do with prosecutors. We can also do this as a justice system, right? I think, I think most people got involved in the work that you do because you believe in this ideal of justice and justice for all. Um, and I think, like you know, John was saying and talking about the indifference, and we get so stuck in this, you know, this culture that has been created where you're just drudging in and out and you're doing the best you can, you lose sight of that vision. And I think when all of the different partners of the criminal justice system work together and recognizing we all have these obstacles, we all have these realities that we're facing, but there is this collective vision, that's when you can also start to make incremental changes both, on the, both culturally and structurally. So I think it's important to not just remember these as this is an activity to do in silos, but how are these all interconnected and how are all of our jobs connected to one another that make up the entire criminal justice system? Mm -hmm. So, so let's think through some of this, and if you all are like really silent and have nothing to say, um, I'll go back and talk more about the gap, and then Genevieve is going to tell you more about each state and how they fund uh, right to counsel, and so you know, we'll, we'll go back if we have to. But let's start by asking this. What pressures do you all face in your work that drive you to accept circumstances that fall short of what justice demands? So what are things you see that might cause either a defendant or a community member or family member feel like justice isn't being achieved? What things might you see? Funding. So up here we have funding, right? Funding. And can, can I, can we give... Give, a, mm -hmm. give her a microphone. Yep. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more? So how does that manifest itself? What only, do you see? There's only so much money to have a public defender's office. Um, what the public defender can't take is given to court appointed who don't want to take it because there's not enough money for them to represent these people and, and to also you know, have their own private practice. So then what? Okay. And then you've got defendants who are frustrated and saying, you know, I just might as well represent myself. Okay. So not enough resources can lead to lawyers who maybe aren't um, incentivized for something other than money and therefore won't do a good job for the client? Correct. Mm -hmm. And not enough lawyers. And not enough hearing. lawyers, yeah. Not enough yeah. lawyers. And not, not enough funds to hire more public defenders or court appointed or. Okay. We have a lot of defendants that call in very disgruntled because our public defender's office now went to an automated phone system mm -hmm. and their public defenders never call them back or they have questions and they usually do not see their public defender until five minutes before their court hearing. And so we get a lot of them calling in very disgruntled and wanting us to help them. And it's really hard because we can't get through to the public defender's office any easier than they can. So 
let's unpack that for a minute, because I think there are a couple of challenges there. One is you have a public defender's office that doesn't have someone designated to answer the phone, and so there is a machine, right? And it's not like that's a foreign experience to any of us, because how many of you have called doctor's offices, credit card companies, right? Uh, utility companies, and you get a machine, and you feel like they don't really care about me. All right, so that's one issue. Another issue is the lawyers aren't available to see them until right before court. Okay. How many of you um, have experienced that kind of frustration from people who need to access your courts? Does anyone have ideas or thoughts about what you might do and I don't mean to skip money but that's such a complicated one I'm trying to find one that might be a little easier to tackle right um, because I don't know that we're gonna leave you we're gonna give you ideas about how to get 10 million dollars <laughs> in the next 20 minutes uh, but, but has anyone ever thought about what you can do to help community members or litigants who feel like their voice isn't being heard, they don't have access to their lawyer. Anyone have strategies? I'll say this is a bad strategy, but this is what some of the courts in my state do is that they will where, set court. Where are you from? Sorry. I'm going to not say. Okay, got it. <laughs> totally fair. Um, fair. But they who's, your, who's your boss? <laughs> <laughs> They, the courts will set court dates every two weeks on a regular basis because lawyers refuse to meet with their clients, so they'll bring them over from the jail, ship them over just so the lawyer will meet with their clients. So um, it prolongs the court, you know, nothing's getting resolved. It's costing the court a lot of money to transport the prisoners. In fact, we worked with a county where they were keeping the prisoners almost an hour, hour and a half away because the jail, most local, was overcrowded. So they were traveling an hour and a half each way to bring these people over just so their clients, um, just so the lawyers would meet with their clients. I'm not suggesting that is a good practice, but it's one way that courts in our state dealt with it. But, but I want to think a little bit more. Let's stay with this for a minute, because what are things that you all feel like you might, is there anything you all feel like you might be able to do to maybe make the system feel a little less unjust? Well, one is to have a case processing system in your court that moves cases along and doesn't let them just languish for years and months and months and months. And so, you know, getting cases before a judge in a timely manner is a way of resolving the thing. Yeah, does it, does that, I'm not saying it does or doesn't, but does it solve the problem of the people not seeing their lawyers? No, no, it, well, it might. It would force the lawyer to meet with the client if the judge is saying, we're going to trial and this thing's gotta be prepared. And it takes that kind of you know, strength of a judge to say, no, we're going, this is gonna move. Does the judge follow through with that if the lawyer doesn't meet the client? Doesn't work if he doesn't or she doesn't. Other thoughts? Yeah. You know, a major problem is public defenders are not paid the same amount as private attorneys. And so oftentimes they take these cases very casually, building a reputation so they can build a practice. And it really is oftentimes disrespectful to the persons they're representing because they show up five minutes on a good day before they walk in the court and have a brief conversation and that's not the kind of representation they should be getting. And they get paid for that. It's less, but they get paid. So you get paid for, in essence, five minutes of consultation and three minutes before the judge when really it should have been more. But, but, but hold on one second, one second. So. Um, I appreciate that because actually our work with public defenders, I mean, what I often say to our lawyers is, you don't have to do this work. You know what you're getting paid. If you feel like you're not willing to give clients the representation you would want for your loved ones for this salary, find something else to do. But we have an obligation, right, that is larger than our salary to make sure people have justice. But I would also say this, having been in courts, Public defenders aren't the only ones I've seen who sometimes feel like I'm not getting paid enough 
And so I'm trying to just move cases along and isn't it lunchtime and let me get going. Are there other folks in your system that might also be guilty of that? Court appointed counsel? That's, that's the public defender other side. If you don't have a public defender's office, then the court appoints counsel. Yeah. All right. Well, is there somebody who's not going to pick on lawyers? Rosalie, I know Rosalie is not. Non-defense attorneys. <laughs> who else? Judges who have to get to their golf game. And should you point that out, you might get fired. <laughs> Rosalie? But no, right, judges might do it. What about some of your colleagues? Any of your colleagues? Have, have any of you, if you're being honest, seen colleagues who just want to move cases along and get done with the day? Maybe a lawyer's trying to argue something, you're like, counsel, come on, it's four o'clock. Have any of you seen that? Anyway, I, I, I'd, I'd urge you to think about all of, all of the players in the system who might. Should we tell on them? Hmm? <laughs> well, we, let, 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 we can talk about it. How, what, what is your response when you see injustice? We can talk about it. Well, I think uh, one of the big parts is, um, as courts, we have to understand that you have to establish a relationship with your litigants, Re regardless of whether or not they have an attorney or not, whether they're being represented with a public defender. They have to understand that they're that they could come to the court, and if they have a complaint, if they have an issue that they have somebody to talk to, that they understand that we do have established relationships with our stakeholders. So, if there is a problem with, say, our prosecutor's office or public defender's office, that they can come, they can come to them, express their concerns. Because let's say hypothetically, you know, this case with the public defender, it's all resolved or whatever. And then let's say years from now, they have a, a, a different case that they have to come to the court for that doesn't involve a public defender. They have to have some sort of faith in the court that if even if the end result wasn't in their favor, that there is some sort of res respect for what for what their intentions were with the court. So, so I, I love that thought. So back to the woman, I'm sorry, what, what to just, can you tell me your name or is that gonna get me too close to where you're from? <laughs> Tasha? Yeah. So Tasha, let's say, is there a, a mechanism for these defendants who feel like they're not accessing their lawyer to let you or someone else in the system know the system's not working for them? And then is there anyone whose ear you have that you might be able to go to, to to influence what lawyers get appointed and which ones don't? Is that a possible solution? Or not a solution, but would it help? I'm not in the position of making those decisions, but I think that, I mean, the problem really is that, I mean, a, an appointed attorney or public defender doesn't want to drive an hour and a half to see his or her client. Are there some that are more responsible than others and we just lack for we there, i mean some counties only have like four f people total to do all jurisdictions juvenile criminal or adult and so weeding out the worst offenders isn't an option for you no so and actually our state has put into um, place standards and things you have now you have to jump through all these hoops just to be on the lists and things like that so um they just keep making it tougher so folks try to stay away from those kind of cases and communicating with your client at least five minutes before trial is not one of those standards right. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you have no one is that <laughs> okay can I flip the question a little bit instead of so we've heard some of the issues that you guys all face or that clients face when trying to access when you know access justice one being accessing their own attorneys are there people where this isn't a problem who work in jurisdictions where it is easier to get a hold of your public attorney or your court appointed attorney and maybe some ideas of why that's working or what you have had to go through to make that work. This so, has been, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, so what I was gonna say was, uh, we have started having our public defenders at the arraignment docket. So when the defendant applies for public defender, if they get appointed right then, they meet with the public defender. We're giving them their reports. They get to read the report. They find out what they need to do before their next court date. So they've already had a meeting with them. So that has seemed to really help. Did a, our judges required our public defender's office to come to the arraignment every day. And uh, we even up the arraignments a little earlier in the day, like mm -hmm. earlier in the morning, so they could get that done and get out and 
go on their way to their next court hearings and we found that it made a huge difference in clients being seen and in court dates being set um, and everyone appearing. We also saw it work because the prosecutors wanted to come then to talk with the public defender while the client was there and some cases settled. So we had it, triaging. Um, this was many years ago, but it, it turned out to be a really effective practice. One of our larger um, counties has jail calls, so all the public defenders are required to be in their offices to answer jail calls during certain hours during the week. So that's an opportunity, even though the calls are recorded, where they can at least explain to them, um, you know, here's your next court date, I'm getting discovery, you know, just some reassurance without having to go to the, I mean, they're still, these same public defenders are required to go to the jails. Um, that's a really good example of a good office um, in our state, but um, the jail calls seem to help um, allay some of that. I never even talked to my lawyer. At least they can get on the phone and say, I'm going to be there for your next hearing or I'm coming to visit you on Tuesday. Yep. Skype. They're an hour and a half away. You can do it with your kids. You can do the grandparents. Everybody's doing it. Why can't we do it? Well, you just have to work, put it together. You get the jail to have a place where the, where the defendant can go by themselves and be in a small room, and they have a computer and a laptop, and the, the defense counsel can be a mile, an hour and a half away or wherever, or even in the same building, but not have to go up to the jail and take the 25 minutes to get through it. And all of a sudden, you have access. And what we have found in, in, in my jurisdiction is they don't even have to see you in person, but if they talk to their, to their public defender, they feel like there's a sense they haven't gone three months without even hearing from them while the people around them are going in and out and over to jail and back to jail. It's a gigantically complicated question, but there has to be a driving force within the court itself, and it needs to be the, it's you, everyone, court administrators needs to go and bring it to the court, to, the, to a judge. You gotta keep going back to the judge and put it, the onus on them for it's their responsibility as well that the right to have an attorney is, is, is in the Constitution. The judge shouldn't be, and it's easy to say, I know, it, judge shouldn't be sitting there knowing that it's only met for five minutes and now we're going to be p making a plea bargain or a deal. But it, it's, it's collectively all the way back to the legislatures aren't given the money because it's not touching them. It's not hitting their families in the same way it is the people that can't afford to get 500 bucks to get out of jail. So you brought up something I just want to throw out to the room. You, you said that, uh, that judges shouldn't be uh, letting people meet with their lawyers for five minutes and then take pleas. How many of you are in systems where sometimes people plead guilty the day they meet their lawyer? Just a couple of you? Really? Right. Yeah. I, I, like that someone comes in, there's a plea offer made, maybe that offer gets them out of jail, otherwise they're on a bond they can't make. Any of you ever see that in your systems? Credit right? for the three days, the three nights. Okay. So let me just go back to this list of things you should expect from your lawyer. I understand that sometimes that helps move along a really busy system, but is it possible for the lawyer to do all these things in one day? When, in a municipal court setting, when the attorney, the defense attorney, has not even gotten a copy of the citation, mm -hmm. these defendants do not know how to communicate what statute code they were arrested for to their attorneys because they're not attorneys. They don't know how to communicate exactly what statute it is. And there's a huge difference in what kind of sentencing you look at for a hit and run versus a striking a fixed object in the state of Georgia. You're looking at jail time and an automatic suspension of a driver's license yeah. versus no jail time. It's one digit off. One digit in the statute you? code. What, what county are you in? Not gonna say? All right. So I don't understand <laughs> how when uh, when the defendants walk into my courtroom and tell me that they have a they have an attorney and I ask them who is their attorney they can't give me their name and they don't know what their attorney looks like how can it be fair to that defendant to have that attorney plead him as guilty 
on something of that magnitude. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you do when that happens? When someone comes in, they say, I have an attorney, but they can't say a name, what they look like, anything? But see, that's where I'm limited. I'm not right. a lawyer. I'm not an attorney. Our prosecutor is the one who has to make that decision as to whether or not to move forward with that case. He has 30, 35 years of, you know, prosecutorial experience. Mm -hmm. I can't override him and say anything. I have mentioned it to him before. And I am lucky enough to work in a court where our prosecutor listens to us. You know, the, our prosecutor and our judge listen to the clerks. And we have several people in our office that have been with us for 20, 25 years because of that. But other courts don't have that. Right. So, I mean, I understand I'm in a very unique situation, but still, how can that possibly be fair to that defendant? So let me just respond really quickly um, be before we go to you. So, so I just want to say, um, I, I actually applaud you because I think that what you just described, I think you described it as though there's nothing I can do, almost a feeling like, I'm helpless when I'm watching this injustice happen. But quite frankly, I see it very differently. I think that so often people watch injustice and sit silently. The fact that you point it out, even when you feel like pointing it out might not make a difference. If enough of you say, if I see something unjust, I'm gonna point it out. Even if it, even if it doesn't matter that time, if we all just simply point it out, we might wake some folks up from that slumber. I actually think what you do is affirmatively trying to chip away at injustice. Yep, I agree completely. So, I, and I agree with that, what she just said. So in our court, at the arraignment docket, defend, the public defender's there, prosecutor's there, they all talk, they're talking for 15 minutes, nobody has any discovery, and they make the offer for the defendant who's got a $500 bond that they can't make, and they and they'll let them out right then and there. So then the so then they say we 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 have a plea. We want to make a deal. And the judge says, you know, I don't know you. You've had enough time. We have, haven't done any discovery. I think you need to bind. We need to keep you over until until next week. Judge, I don't want to go here a week. I'll take that deal a hundred times over. The public defender, based on what you said earlier, needs to do what? Well, that the, his decision or her decision is, I want out now. And that's the problem with the mass incarcerations that we're doing is we're having so many people being brought in. But there's, a, if there's two sides to it. In our court, we're trying to move people as, as best we can, and we get faced with that. And so the, and we've, I've had heard judges having a conversation. I want to make sure they're entitled to their rights, but it means they spent a week in jail. And how, what's our evidence? Three days in jail and your life just got invariably changed forever. So it's, it's, it's really tough to, to try to figure out where the, the right level is. Of course, it's depending on the level of the crime. In municipal court, you're probably not being held in jail. You may be in a circuit or district court. I, I agree with you, right? I completely agree with you. We actually have an exercise we do with our lawyers where we say to our lawyers, you walk into court, you've got 15 new cases. You've got three hours to talk to those folks before court starts. One of those cases, a prosecutor comes up to you, it's an armed robbery, they say, listen, we will give this guy a plea deal to robbery. He can get out today on probation, right? But he's gotta take it today or it's off the table. You know that if he takes that robbery plea, he'll get out, but he also might lose his house because he lives in subsidized housing, might lose his job because it's a government job. And we talk to our lawyers about your obligation. And at the end of the day, the lawyer can't change the fact that that injustice is happening. The lawyer can help the client understand the terrible situation they're in. And ultimately, the client has to make that decision. But what we say to our lawyers, and I think you're, you're, you're doing this, is what you can't do is come to think that's OK. The moment you become resigned to that as the way justice is, you're part of the problem. While you know what you're doing isn't right, at least you're aware of it. And you're always looking for an opening to maybe just try to raise it if you can. That's doing something. Other examples. So unless you have something, Genevieve, I have another question. Go for it. Where are we at on time? We got 
Eight minutes. Okay. So, so we've talked about lawyers, um, but I really want to push you guys to think. What have you seen from court managers, court administrators, court clerks, right? And as we do in voir dire, we can say it could be you or a loved one or someone close to you, because you don't have to admit it's you if you don't want to. But what have you seen, right? We're just out of frustration that one of those actors may have sort of sent the message that uh, you don't matter. Or where out of frustration they have perpetuated injustice, moved a case along. Does anyone have an example of, 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 of how court managers, court administrators can actually kind of start to contribute to injustice? Because I've got some from my own experience which I'll share if y'all don't. No one? Anyone see a courtroom clerk? I don't know if that's what y'all call them, the person who sits in the courtroom, right? The beginning of the day before the judge takes the bench. Whole line of people, right, waiting to check in. And they have no idea what's going on. Some of them are loved ones. Some of them are, are the accused. And they come up and they have questions and the and the, and, and, and the courtroom clerk's just snapping because they're trying to move through the docket. They're like, yo, yo, we'll get to that later. Just sit down. Have a seat. Anyone, see, anyone ever see something like that? I think sometimes you see that because that, that courtroom personnel, um, courtroom personnel are frequently told by judges that they are not lawyers and they don't need to do anything except that particular thing. Mm -hmm. So it can result in some trauma. Yeah. We, we all suffer trauma when, we, when we're in this system. Absolutely. I'm not saying this judgmentally, right? I think this is human nature, where we start to get worn down from injustice. What might a response be when a judge says, you're not a lawyer, right? Don't give people advice. Is the only response, ma'am, I can't help you have a seat. The judge will be on the bench soon. What might the response be? We tell the clerks of court to give out as much information that they can. It, and so I think they use that you no know, legal advice as a crutch to not help people. And we're encouraging them, look, give them pamphlets, give them website, give them what you have as information. Just don't say, I can't help you okay. um, because that's not helpful. Um, but, but for years, it's been their go-to. It's an easy go-to. So we encourage them to give them uh, if you're if you're unhappy with a lawyer, here's the bar association. Here's their website. Here's their phone number. Here's their address. A uh, lawyer didn't treat you right. Contact them. Judge didn't treat you right. Contact the jerk. What well, we call it the jerk, <laughs> the Judicial Inquiry Review Commission. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's their acronym. So <laughs> they they picked it, I guess. So we do try. And I, I get a lot of calls from customers who are very unhappy about what happened in their courts, and that is the advice I give them. Are you unhappy with the clerk? Then this is who the clerk reports to. Who are you unhappy with? Tell me, and I'm going to tell you who you can make a report to. And that's the best we can do to help them, I, I think. So I want to say, I, just, I love the fact that you use the word customer, because I really do think that everyone in this room who interacts with the public you are involved in customer service. And much like I said to public defenders, you don't get paid a lot. If you don't want to do this job, find something else to do. I think for those of us who sign up to be involved in customer service, right, we shouldn't do the job if we're not willing to treat customers with respect. And, and, and I think that all of us need to think about what it feels like when we call anyone, doctor's office, Verizon, and the difference, it's not sometimes even what you hear, it's how it's told to you, how it's said. And so I think my parting words would be this, because I know we're running out of time, but keep in mind, you are dealing with people who are sometimes traumatized because this is what they always experience in courts. And they're coming into court traumatized, and even if you can simply treat them with respect, treat them with dignity, kindly tell them, I can't help you with that. Here's a number you could call. If you'd have a seat, we'll get started soon. That alone might be enough to make them feel a little bit better about the justice system. 
other thought? No, I, mean, I think that sums it up well. And I think it's also important, you know, just how we all play a role in being part of this solution. And, you know, we all can get stressed or frustrated with, you know, the different cultural pressures or structural pressures that are on us. I think everybody who's part of the criminal justice system represents the entire system. And it's important to remember that as well. So sometimes just a smiling face or saying, I'm sorry, I don't have that information, but if you take a seat, we'll get to you as soon as possible. That can have a trickle effect, and then people can feel they can, it'll increase their trust and their belief in kind of the system overall and in, increase people's kind of satisfaction and experiences. Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to, I think it was your point earlier that you might be in as a defendant one day, but you might be in as a victim the next. Um, and how you're treated one day will impact how you come back and want to be treated again or whether you come back in your experiences. So I think it's important to kind of remember that um, and be cognizant of it. I want to um, take this opportunity and invite you to thank our presenters for indicating to us very clearly that there is something that every single one of us can do to make a difference and to move us towards liberty and justice for all. all right. Thank you all so much. And we have some handouts. Yeah. And then here's our information if you guys need would like to contact us at all and we'll also be around. <laughs>